All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Wild Neighbors Speaker Series. I'm Johanna Arendt, and I work with Travis County, and we're really happy to welcome Craig's Hen Craig Hensley today as our speaker. He's the Texas Nature Trackers biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and he'll be talking about uh, backyard birds that you can see in Texas today. Um, if you have any questions for him during the presentation, you can put it in the Q&A section down at the bottom, and um, we'll be reading those questions at the end during the Q&A period. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a background about this um, speaker series and the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, which hosts it. I'm going to go ahead and share a few slides. Okay, so um, the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series is a collaboration of Travis County, where I work, and City of Austin, and uh, we are the two largest land managers of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, and um, there are a number of other partners, though, which I'll mention in a moment, and we started this series a few years ago because we as one of the largest urban, you know, uh, nature preserves in the country, we have a lot of neighbors, thousands and thousands of neighbors, and we get a lot of questions about the wildlife that people see. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to connect people with folks who are experts in their specific fields. Um, so folks can learn more about the, the nature that we have here and, and we can learn how to support that nature and, um, and help it thrive and do things that are going to be beneficial um, for our wild neighbors. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this is a map of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Uh, just to orient you, we've got downtown Austin here in the lower right, and then um, here's Lake Travis. So the preserve itself is over 32,000 acres. It's really huge. And it was set aside as um, mitigation. It was uh, part of an agreement that said, um, if we set aside this really large amount of endangered species habitat, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife would allow the majority of, of uh, the remaining endangered uh, species habitat to be developed. So it was a really huge, um, amazing, you know, uh, big deal that happened that created this preserve. And it's more of a system of, of preserves than one large area of just uh, a, a preserve, as you can see. And there are a number of partners that came together to make it happen. Um, the purple there on the map is Travis County managed uh, BCP land. The darker green is City of Austin. There's also Nature Conservancy and uh, LCRA, Travis Audubon Society. So lots of different partners coming together to make this pretty amazing preserve a reality. And on this slide, I just wanted to show you some of the species that we protect there. These are, um, as you can see, we've got two migratory songbirds, the golden sheep warbler and the black cat vireo. And then we have eight karst invertebrates, so um, insects and arachnids that live underground in caves. And we only actually had space for six, uh, but there, there are eight, I promise. I'm, I'm sorry, actually, there are only six. There's eight species in total. Whew, Friday. Um, so, and by protecting these most uh, vulnerable species, the ones that are the first to become endangered, we actually are able to protect the entire incredibly uh, vibrant ecosystem that we have here in the Balcones Canyonlands. Um, so for more information about the preserve and about the Balcones Canyonlands in general, um, please visit our websites and our uh, social media. We'll be putting those links in the chat and um, we're happy to, to talk about that and public access and the, the hikes and, you know, uh, volunteer opportunities that we have generally during non-COVID times, but um, there are some opportunities that, that do come up. So please stay involved and, and uh, engage with us. We'd love to get to know y'all better. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Craig Hensley, who again is with the Nature Trekkers Texas Nature Trackers program with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And we're just really excited to have him as a speaker here today. And uh, take it away, Craig. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. 
Okay, let's see if we can make this work in real time then. Um, first of all, well, uh, thank you for the invitation this morning. We're going to, uh, or this afternoon, I guess it is now. I'm going to try to share up my screen right away here and see what happens. First, we're going to, I'm going to turn my camera off so I don't look like quite the fool here. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started here. So uh, uh, I was invited today to talk about uh, our backyard feathered friends. And so I want to give you a little bit of a presentation about um, that, kind of focusing on birds that you might see in your backyard, how you might attra actually attract uh, birds uh, to your backyard around where you live, and, um, and then uh, provide you an opportunity to ask some questions at the end. So we'll get started here right off the bat. Let's see here. Shift slides. There we go. Um, so first of all, I am with the Texas Nature Trackers Program, uh, which is part of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's Wildlife Diversity Program. And basically what myself and my teammate, Tanya Homayun, do is we try to engage uh, people to become community scientists to help us track wild populations of flora and fauna throughout the state of Texas. So in non-COVID times, we'd be traveling the state talking to master naturalists and other community groups about how you could use iNaturalist and and uh, engage in helping us with uh, conservation uh, throughout the state of Texas. Within our little group of people, we are part of a community stewardship and engagement team. And basically we're just trying to reach out to the public, engage the public, educate the public, and then help the, edu uh, the public educate themselves essentially. So let's get right into the, the presentation. So what do you need to attract feathered friends to your backyard? Um, most of you probably know the, the three big things. One, would, of course, would be food, and that food could be seeds, it could be fruit, it could be insects. Not that we go out and buy a bunch of insects and throw them in our yard, but I'll talk about that, how that happens uh, in a little bit in a whole different way. And of course, nectar would be another food source. And that nectar could be food, uh, nectar you, you mix in your kitchen and put into a hummingbird feeder, or it could be in the plantings you put in your yard. Another big one is water. Um, in fact, if you are going to want to attract wildlife of any kind, whether it's a bird or a mammal or an insect, uh, you can never go wrong with water. Um, water, in fact, will attract more things than seeds will in terms of birds um, and a wider variety of things as well throughout the year. And then finally, another way to attract uh, birds to your backyard is through shelter, having places where they feel safe and secure uh, that could be trees and shrubs that they can escape to if a predator comes into the yard. Could be a brush pile or do the same thing. Or you, in the summertime breeding season, you put up a nest box or some kind of nesting structure to in, in, uh, encourage and, and invite the birds to your yard. So first, let's talk about food. And of course, when you start talking about uh, putting out, uh, if you've never done it before, it can be overwhelming. If you have, it's still a little bit overwhelming, especially if you go and try to find a feeder of some kind. There are so many different feeders made by so many different manufacturers that uh, it gets to be a little head spinning. Uh, but generally, you can either buy hopper feeders, which is that photograph in the middle, which of course has a male cardinal on the left and a female cardinal on the right. And that you can put seed in, it's up off the ground. It's kind of, it can be a real attractive feeder. You can buy those mesh bags you see on the left that are attracting lesser goldfinches and pine siskins. Uh, those you fill with Niger seed, and we'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Uh, but those are real good for those kind of birds, the finches. Uh, down on the bottom, you can either put a seed directly on the ground, or you can have like a, a platform feeder that you see there that lots and lots and lots of pine siskins are in right there eating seed. And then, of course, you can use suited feeders. You can either make your own suited feeder out of, say, a log and have, a, have your own recipe like we do at our home. Uh, or you can buy commercial um, uh, suet feeders and suet, so it, you don't have to do any of that mixing up and all of that stuff. I will tell you, however, our formula that we use, which we got from someone else, is a hit with all the birds, where sometimes those cakes uh, don't get hit by uh, everything, uh, and it kind of depends on where you are. So what do you feed specifically? So we, you can go out and buy mixes of seed. You can spend as much or as little as you want. Um, we tend to only buy specific kinds of seed um, because we're trying to attract the widest variety of birds and then also not pay money on seed that none of the birds are going to eat. And you'll find it in a lot of those bags, 
there's a lot of fill seed that really isn't going to be used by many birds other than starlings or house sparrows or grackles, three birds that generally people don't want covering up their backyard. So we use black oil sunflower seed. You can either get it in the shell, that's the cheapest way to go, or you can get hulled sunflower seed. You're gonna pay probably at least twice the, the amount for that, but that way it doesn't leave behind that residue of mess of, of shelled sunflower seeds. But black oil sunflower seeds attract the widest variety of birds of any kind of seed that's out there uh, on the market. If you're looking to feed ground uh, feeding birds, uh, that would be native sparrows, things like that, um, white millet is the way to go. I only use white, I don't use red milo, I don't use anything else. Um, I only use white millet on the ground. And some people put them in their feeders, their tube feeders, and that in the summertime will actually attract painted buntings to their, uh, sometimes to the yard of painted buntings or in their area. But white millet is a great small seed. You can put it out, the birds clean it up very, very quickly. And then the third kind of seed that we use is Niger, black Niger um, uh, thistle seed. And it comes, it's kind of expensive, but it comes in very tiny, tiny seeds. So they actually have bird feeders specifically for Niger seed uh, because of the small size of the seed. Um, and, or you can use those mesh bags like you saw in that photograph a couple of slides ago. So who are you gonna attract if you're gonna be out there? And some of you may know all of these and some of you may not be familiar with all. So we're gonna try and cover as many as we can in the time that we have. The big four is what I like to call, these are the four, if you put up a bird feeder in your yard, chances are you're gonna get these four birds for sure in your backyard uh, where you live. And of course, the Northern Cardinal is one that everybody likes to attract. That photograph, of course, is of the male. Uh, they're usually a bright red. The female is kind of a tan color to kind of blend in with the, the dead leaves, if you will, uh, in the picture. And then the, two, the one in the center, some people call flying pigs because when you start getting white winged doves, you get a lot of white winged doves and white winged doves eat a lot of food. Um, so they can clean out a house and home in terms of bird seed. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you don't want them in big numbers, then stay away from the white millet and keeping things off the ground and, and you'll have less of those uh, bothering you. The other two birds in the, in the, in the, cor in the, on the sides, the Carolina chickadee and the black crested titmouse um, are both beautiful, regularly common songbirds that we have around here, probably two of the more common. They're year round residents like the other two. They actually can be attracted to your yard using nest boxes. They're what are known as secondary cavity nesting birds. So they don't make their own cavity, but they'll use a cavity of an old woodpecker nest or a nest box to nest in. Um, and they are actually cousins. If you look, their bill shape is almost identical. They're very feisty birds, very, uh, uh, can be very territorial birds, uh, but are very fun to watch as they uh, grab one seed at a time, take it to a tree branch, bang it open between their feet, eat the, the, the in innards of the, of the seed, and then go back and get another one one at a time but very common for birds that you should expect in your backyard. Even if you're not feeding birds and you have some trees and shrubs, you shouldn't be surprised to see these four birds. Moving on to the finches, we have normal, in normal years in the winter time, we have three species of finches for sure. Two of them are resident. Two, uh, and in this picture, you'll notice I've got four here. We're gonna talk about that pine siskin a little bit separately, but the two that are resident, which means they're birds that nest in Texas, so they are here year round, are the lesser goldfinch and the house finch. And both of these are examples of males. If these were females, in the case of the house finch, it would be a, a the, the background color of the bird's wings would be the same. The female would lack any of that reddish color that you see and it would have streaks down its chest. So pretty easy to identify. Um, the lesser goldfinch, the female is just kind of a dull yellow, whereas this one has, where's that, the male, uh, the adult male lesser goldfinch, where's that jet black top of the head all the way down the back and the wings and a bright yellow chest. Um, but they're year round. They come and go. Some people have them in their feeders for a while and then they disappear. And it may very well be that there's other native wild foods out there that they're taking advantage of. And your food that you're using is maybe a supplemental a part of their diet at certain times of the year. So don't be surprised if that ebbs and flows um, uh, as you go through the year. The one on the top left is the American goldfinch. This is a winter plumage of the American goldfinch, which looks kind of dull. 
the male, if you can imagine, the male is gold, bright gold, like the name Goldfinch says, with a black top knot. Uh, but they usually don't get that color until they're ready to migrate back north to Iowa, where I grew up, and that's where they're going to breed, and then they come down here for the winter time. So they're going to look more like that, but you can kind of see they've got that that uh, light, that light colored line on the on the um, wing, and that helps you identify them. They're a little bit bigger than lesser goldfinches. They will flock with the lesser goldfinch, so you'll see mixes of them uh, uh, potentially, whether it's out in the wild or in uh, at your feeder. And then the fourth bird, the pine siskin. We're very fortunate this year. We have pine siskins all over the place. Pine siskins are another type of finch. Real pointy beak. You notice they have a streaked chest, but notice that little bit of yellow in the wings. That kind of sets that aside from the female house finch. Otherwise, you might think that's a female house finch, actually. But these are a little bit smaller. They travel in big flocks. They come in and they go crazy on feeders. Um, and if you have native plantings that have seeds still in the husks of the of the dried flower heads, they'll take out those and eat those as well. But they're what is referred to as a bird that erupts. They are an eruptive species. So some years where their food supply, for whatever reason, fails, they'll move farther south than they normally would. Every winter we'll get a few, but this particular year they are here by the thousands. So watch for them if you're feeding finches. You'll, you, if you don't have them yet, you probably will sometime during the winter time. But a neat little bird. And then of course, if you're feeding, um, you're going to get all kinds of native sparrows. I didn't should have put a picture in of a of a house sparrow, but I didn't. House sparrows, you, most of you are familiar with. They are not sparrows, and they're not native. They're actually from Europe, and they're a weaver finch. But these are examples, a few, very few examples of our little brown birds, uh, other than the one up in the upper left hand corner, um, that are native in grassland habitats throughout parts of Texas. And certainly over the the the, uh, the tall grass prairie, the mid grass prairie, the short grass prairie, farther to the north of Texas. And in the winter time, many of these species come here in large numbers, and a few a few of them will end up in your backyard if you're providing food and you've got the right kind of habitat setting. So we we put in a brush pile. These kind of birds love to use that brush pile for cover and also to roost during the night. So uh, just, you can see the Lincoln Sparrow. The chipping is probably the most common. They travel in pretty good flocks. Uh, they look very similar to that clay colored sparrow. The clay colored sparrows have already moved south, but they'll come through the area in migration, both in the fall and the spring. Um, and then the bird on the lower right is actually a young white crowned sparrow, adults, Adult white crown sparrows have a black, jet black and white head, but this one you can see is tan and kind of gray. And then the bird in the upper left-hand corner would be a real surprise in your yard, in most people's yards, but if you live next to a wooded area along a creek bottom, someplace up there in the Balcones area, don't be surprised if you see a spotted toe, a dark hood, bright, deep red eye, and then that, that uh, rusty patch on either side of the body with the white chest, a really, and they call it spotted because on the back side of them, they're black with lots of white spots. Really striking, very large member of the sparrow family. So that's one you can get on, on kind of rare occasion, but I want to throw it in there because uh, you might actually see them. And they have a behavior, by the way, that helps you identify them. They, they do what they call back scratching. So they'll be on the ground and they'll do, they'll scratch, they'll take both feet and they'll scratch backwards real quick. So it looks like they're hopping up in the air and that's to move things out of the way to find seeds. And they'll actually do that in double, they'll do it twice real quickly as they forage on the ground. So that's a whole nother group that you can, you can, uh, you can track if, if, if you uh, desire. They are a challenge to identify, but I like a good challenge, always have. And uh, if you're a, any kind of a bird watcher, you, you'll, you'll like this challenge too with them. And then we have wrens. The two wrens that we normally have year round here in this part of Texas are the Beeweeks wren and the Carolina wren. The Carolina wren is very rusty brown on the tail, on the back, on the wings, and that, that, that wash all over the belly. Um, and then they have a bright white wing uh, eye, or eye bar that goes above the eye. You'll notice the bird to the left, the Beeweeks, also has that white line above the eye. But you'll notice they're not as rusty and their tail is much more gray than rusty red. So they, but they are very common year-round residents. 
very vocal birds. You've probably heard them. Um, the Carolina Wren, for example, I always think it's singing cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. Uh, and sometimes it does sound like it's singing that. But these are very common. They'll nest in nest boxes. They eat insects most of the time, but they will be attracted to suet uh, that you can see right there. So uh, that's another uh, good way to attract these two birds. And also they like to, they'll nest anywhere just about. So if you have any kind of yard that isn't just, you know, bare of vegetation, you should expect to see both of these two birds, these birds from time to time. The house wren is a smaller version of these two guys, shorter tail. Notice it doesn't have any bright colors or any wing, white eye, eye, uh, eye bars or anything like that. It's just kind of a dull little bird with its tail flipped up in the air. And these birds are migratory. They come here in the winter time. They return north in, in the spring. So watch, especially in brush piles or around brushy areas, you might actually scare up a house wren. They're really a neat little bird. And then we have, of course, tree huggers. These are birds that you don't have to do a whole lot for um, to get them here. You just have to have trees. Um, and uh, two of them, of course, are woodpeckers. Uh, the one on the left is the downy woodpecker. It's a small black and white woodpecker. The male would have a little bit of red on the back of the head. This happens to be a female. They have a white line right down the back and then all the white spotting look a little bit like the ladderback woodpecker, only the ladderback's a little bit bigger. Um, the bird on the far right, the golden fronted woodpecker, you can see the gold above the, above the beak, and then the little red patches, reddish orange patches on the head. That happens to be a male of the species. The female would lack some of that reddish that you see there. That's a large, that's our normal largest woodpecker. Now, if you got east of I-35, I you'd start to see a red-bellied woodpecker and then a little bit farther east, you might start picking up our largest woodpecker in North America, which is the pileated. The bird in the center is another bird that we don't see very often. This is another winter where we're starting to see more and more of them. They kind of erupt as well. So some years we see them, some years we don't see any of them. And that is the red-breasted nuthatch. And you'll notice it's upside down. So woodpeckers forage by moving up tree trunks, the nuthatch actually forages uh, by going down tree trunks and around branches and things like that. Very acrobatic, really neat little bird, long pointed beak for probing in bark for insects, insect eggs, spiders, things like that. And of course we have nectar sippers. Of course the, the one way to get them in the summertime is to put up a hummingbird feeder. Uh, in migration, in our part of Texas, we're going to see ruby-throated hummingbirds in the spring and in the fall, but generally not during the summertime. The, the, the hummingbird we get in the summertime is the black chin hummingbird there on the left. You'll notice it has a very black chin, but it also has a, in the right light, it has a purple band of beautiful uh, iridescent feathers. That whole area right there on both these birds is called a gorget. And that's how you kind of identify a lot of hummingbirds. Female hummingbirds don't have these, and so they're really tricky to identify. I should tell you, if you still have hummingbird feeders out, um, most people don't, but a few people keep them out because we also have some wintertime hummingbird migration from the western part of the United States. Uh, and I recently saw some pictures of some broad-tailed hummingbirds at people's feeders. Some weird uh, kind of unusual ones will show up in the wintertime if you have a feeder out, but most of the time you won't see anything happen. Uh, but wonderful, two wonderful uh, birds that are uh, obviously attracted to those humming. Oh, and I should say one more word. Let me go back. Um, you do not have to use any red coloring in the, in the liquid that you prefer, that you prepare. And normally it's about one part sugar to four parts water. Um, some people in the fall will make it more one, uh, one part uh, uh, sugar to three parts water to make it more concentrated, but generally one to four is good. So one part sugar, four parts water. But you don't have to use any of the red coloration. The hummingbird feeders themselves are red. That's all you need. Um, the, uh, and I don't know if it's still the way, but uh, at one time they were selling the hummingbird food. And I know they still sell it, but it had a red dye in the, in the mix. And that was supposedly harmful to the hummingbird. So don't use that red dye just to be on the safe side. You don't need it. Another way to attract nectar feeders is to plant native plants. And so I put this slide in here. I know these aren't feathered friends, but they are flying friends. Um, but by using native plants, we use them in our yard all the time. You're attracting a wide variety of insects from bees and butterflies to the caterpillars that become butterflies to a host of other insects. And as you attract them, 
not only are you attracting nectar feeding flowers, I've seen um, hummingbirds feed on these yellow flowers, which are known as cowpen daisy. I've seen them nectar on that purple flower, which is known as skeleton plant. So hummingbirds will use those native plants to nectar on. This doesn't have to be only a red flower. Um, but then you're also attracting all of these other insects, which by the way, become food for a whole nother group of birds that you can attract to your yard uh, year round. Another example here are some more flying friends that you can attract if you're using native plants, the, the, the giant or the, the eastern tiger swallowtail in the upper left hand corner, of course the monarch in the middle, and then down below on the lower left you've got the uh, variegated fritillary and then uh, there's one of our native bees going to a penstemon flower um, there on the far right side. So it, by attracting these guys, you're attracting not only nectar feeders by having the flowers there, you're attracting birds that will eat some of these critters out here as well. And those insect eaters would be things like the great crested flycatcher, which uh, nests in our area in the summertime. It leaves for the winter um, it, because it's an insect eating bird. The blue headed vireo is a migratory bird through here in both spring and fall. But if you have, you know, if you have good resources of insects and that kind of thing, uh, they will come and visit your yard. And then in the winter time, the yellow rump warbler. Now is the time of the year we see yellow rump warblers. They're insect eaters. They will eat fruit as well. And so we're gonna show you some examples of fruit eaters here in just a moment. But they'll eat fruit. We used to, we have pecan trees in our yard. We would have so many pecans that we would take them in piles and take them out on the sidewalk and we would stomp on them and break them open. They weren't a good quality pecan pie pecans. And then the, the yellow rump warblers in the morning would be down there eating all of those little bits and morsels of pecans. So they're very adaptable, but that is one of our warblers, note the thin bill, um, that will be here in the wintertime. And I should tell you also that if you're going to attract birds to your backyard, you're not only going to get the birds that eat seed, you're also going to get the birds that eat the birds. So these are two birds. And I'll, by the way, all the pictures that you're seeing in this presentation all of them have been taken in my yard and I have a small 0 0.22, 0 0.23 or something like that hectare or acre yard. So it's a typical suburban yard. I live down in Bernie and all of this nature comes to my yard, A, because I put out some food and B, I put out um, water, which we're gonna get to next. But don't be surprised if you have every once in a while a hawk come through your yard, they eat those birds. So it's a different trophic level, if you will, but don't be disappointed because, of course, when you're feeding, attracting some wildlife, somebody else is going to, everything wants to be eaten or is going to get eaten by something else. So I don't guess anybody wants to be eaten, but uh, that's going to happen. The bird on the left is a bird eating hawk called the Cooper's hawk that nests in our area as a year round resident. And another year round resident, of course, the red shouldered hawk. And they are birds of woodland areas. Uh, and, uh, uh, they're just beautiful birds to see and occasionally they will get uh, uh, a bird, So, but not very often. So now going from leaving the, the seed part of it behind, um, water. Water is where it is at and that is no kidding. So these are all examples of birds. If you'll notice these birds, they don't really have super thick stout bills like a cardinal. Now the summer tanager's bill is a little bit thicker because it's eating, can eat a lot of big fruits. Uh, but you'll notice they're kind of long bills. The hermit thrush and American robin are cousins. They're fruit eating birds by and large. So they're, if they're here in the winter time, like the hermit thrush and the robin, they're going to be eating those fruits. And when you eat a lot of sugar, apparently you need to drink a lot of water. So these guys are coming to the bird bath all the time uh, to drink water. They'll take a bath in the bird bath. So having a little bit of water will attract the birds that you normally aren't gonna see at your feeders, your bird seed feeders. The other two birds, the yellow-throated vireo and the summer tanager are two birds that we would see in the summertime around where we all live and they breed here. Uh, but again, they're not gonna be coming to a bird feeder per se, but they will come to water. So again, water is super important and just adds to the diversity of wildlife that's gonna visit your yard. And here are a few other examples. I already showed you the red-breasted nuthatch. Um, it comes to the bird bath three or four times a day. Uh, the Eastern Phoebe is another resident bird, lives here year round, at least in our area. I don't know if they do, if they persist that far north where you all are in the Balcones. Um, I'm guessing some of them do. They're in flying insect eaters. Uh, and then the Northern Mockingbird, of course, most of us are familiar with that being our state bird. 
um, and a, just a just a very beautiful bird. Again, guarding fruit bearing trees this time of the year, or vines like mistletoe, um, things like that. They're going to be guarding those fruits from all of the other birds. That's their winter food supply. And then we've even had in this little suburban yard, we've had eastern bluebirds show up, uh, all to drink of water. So. Again, a real nice plethora of birds, if you will, will come to a bird bath. And it can be as simple as a dish with water in it. It can be a concrete bird bath. We have a water feature that has bubbling water that was there when we bought the house. And then we took a, rock, a pile of rocks and made our own water feature that has dripping water. The sound of water helps, is said to help attract the birds, and I believe it. And I want to just show you this. I, hopefully this won't be too scratchy. We'll play this for a few seconds. This is what can happen. These birds are known as cedar waxwings. The two, in, the, the two brown ones, the one on the right is a lesser goldfinch. And I want you to watch what happens because every day at our house, this happens in the wintertime. Cedar waxwings travel into our part of the, uh, the country in the wintertime in large flocks. They're fruit eating birds. They need to drink a lot of water. So let's see if we can make this play and hopefully it's not too jumpy. As you can tell this was in the early spring, but here they come. Hopefully, they're, hopefully that's, that uh, is actually working for you, but watch how fast they take their drinks. They fill their, their, uh, their bill quickly and get on out of there. But this is, I mean, you can see where our back door is. We just sit there and watch. This happens to be shot on a little GoPro camera that was on the, on the regular concrete bird bath, but isn't that something? So this is the kind of fun you can have in your backyard just with water. Again, if you don't put any bird seed out, just water will, will, will provide you these kinds of opportunities to, to enjoy the nature that is in our area. So there you go. So what can you do with all of this? I, because I teach about community science all the time, I can't do a presentation without mentioning that. Um, you can participate in a Christmas bird count. Uh, there are, there, even though it's COVID this year, they're doing dis socially distanced Christmas bird counts. Uh, you can check with uh, them to see, just go online, look up Christmas bird count, see if there's a bird count area in your area. You can participate if you, if you cho so choose. You can actually count birds in your backyards through Project Feeder Watch with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I, I do this, so every two days out of every seven, I, I count birds. I just do it as much as I can. And the data, you can get an app now and download it all on an on a app real in real time. So you don't have a paper copy that you have to send off or anything like that anymore. Great way to track the birds that are coming to people's yards. They've been doing this for a very long time. There's even been at least one published book on backyard birds and what is attracted to them and where they are and what their numbers are uh, based on the data from Project Feeder Watch. So that's a real fun activity to do. You can eBird, if you don't know about eBird. Uh, eBird is the way people bird watch now. That it's an app you can download for free. Um, again, it's through Cornell. It's a fantastic way to log the birds that you see in your backyard. And, it, and you don't have to be a birder to do it. Just get it, keep track this way. You, you'll have your running list on your phone. You'll also be sharing that data in real time so that people get a better understanding of the birds in their uh, across the country. And just to show you one more quick video, I want you to watch this map. You can go on their website and see all of these for lots of different migration periods, also for specific species. This is actually tracking migration based on observations from eBird. I'm gonna hit the play button here and just watch. So those, those colors, as they turn more yellow, that's bird migration happening at night. That red line is the setting sun. So look at all the migration that's going on right there in that one particular day. That was on October 6th. And then as sunrise comes, you'll notice that the colors go from that bright golden yellow. Here comes sunrise. Migration is pretty much over for most of the birds. So that's a real thing that you can actually contribute to by participating in community science. And then of course the program that we use a lot in all the presentations we do is iNaturalist. It's a free downloaded app. You can track all forms of, of flora and fauna across the state. And the other thing I wanna, and you, so you can contribute that data to conservation uh, and, and understanding of our natural resources. You, it's also like walking around with a nature encyclopedia in your hand, because when you're using it, you can identify, if there's a plant out there, you go, I don't know what that is. Use iNaturalist, take a picture of it, upload it to iNaturalist, it will help you identify that plant. And it's about as good 
on just about everything that, of any anything that I know. So that's really my presentation. I think I had 25 minutes. Hopefully that's about what I used. Uh, my contact information is down here. If you have questions beyond today or want to find out more about iNaturalist, we actually do online now, of course, uh, virtual uh, iNaturalist uh, workshops. We'd be happy to host one for you. Got distracted for a second. I had American Goldfinch out my window. Um, but I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you, and hopefully you found this to be a valuable experience today. I'm going to stop sharing now. If I can get my mouse over to where it needs to be. There it is. There we go. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. A lot of great information there. And I just love that you used all your own pictures. It's just you've got a lot of really good stuff coming to you hard. That's I awesome. do. It's, it's amazing. I, in fact, my iNaturalist project now is up to about 270 species of plants and animals in my yard. Uh, and again, wow. it's just a small suburban yard. Most it was it was all St. Augustine grass when I got there, and now there's far less St. Augustine grass, and consequently, much more diversity. Yeah. So we do have a lot of questions here in the chat. I'm going to go through some okay. of them. We'll do as many as time allows. And then, folks, if you have anything else you okay. want to ask, uh, ask Craig, please put them in the Q&A section, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, the first one that popped up here was an issue they've experienced in the past is that as soon as they put out a feeder and the feeder got established, rats move in and start eating. Do you have any tips to minimize rodent attracting? Well, <laughs> I've seen a rat or two in my backyard. Um, yeah, that unfortunately, when you put out seed on, especially on the ground, uh, you're going to probably get rodents that are going to show up. Um, you know, uh, you can you can put out snap traps for them, especially if you don't have any cats in the in your yard um, uh, or dogs that aren't going to step on the trap. Um, it's a it's it's a challenging one. To, you know what you could do is use feeders off the ground and use hold seed instead of seed that's gonna have the shells laying all over the place. And if you can do that, that might help eliminate some of that, that uh, rodent activity that's out there. But yeah, their uh, rodents, including rats, are everywhere. And so you're gonna attract a few things like that. So um, that's, that, that, would, that would, might be a solution is trying to get that seed off the ground or keep it off the ground as best you can. Yeah, a comment somebody put, and I like this one too, is like, they put up owl boxes and the owls um, take out the rats for them. <laughs> you know, right. and, and again, having we happen to have a pair of red-shouldered hawks that literally nest across the street in a creek bottom, and uh, they're in my backyard, our backyard, quite a lot, and uh, my, my hope is that they're eating uh, the rats and the rodents and maybe even a squirrel or two, because with all our pecan trees, uh, Goodness knows we got more, more squirrels you can shake a stick at. Awesome. Um, okay, so up next we have, so uh, what is the best way to tell the difference between the lesser and American goldfinch females? Okay, so um, probably, hang on, hang on, hang on, hold that thought there. So probably the best way to look at, first of all, American goldfinches in the wintertime, the males and females look very similar. So but they're larger, they're significantly larger. And when I say significantly, it may only be a quarter to a half an inch, but it's enough if you're watching the birds to tell. But let me pull up my Sibley guide. First of all, make sure you got a good bird book. Um, I've, I don't know how many times I've run into people that ask me questions on how to identify birds and they don't even have a bird book. But let me, um, let's see here if I, can, if I can help you out here a little bit. Um, Gee whiz. Let's see here. This may not be as easy as I think. So on the on this side over here, these are the lesser goldfinches. So you'll notice that they're a little bit yellow uh, overall. These are females or juveniles. Here's the female here, real dull, but notice those two bright wing bars are real noticeable. And then they're going to have some pale color here. Now they're very similar here, but again, there's more size. The other thing when they fly, you'll notice that they the lesser has a real distinct wing patch. Uh, there uh, where, the, where the goldfinches have a little white, you can see the, the white wing bar, but not that big patch that's beyond the wing bar. But here's a male winter finch. Really the best way is to look at the size of them. And of course, here's, the, here's what the male is going to look like before migration. Here's what the male looks like in the wintertime, a little bit brighter, but not doesn't have that black up here. But here's the male. Here's a juvenile male, lesser. Um, but with those females, they're a little bit tricky. 
So I would say the best thing to do is really start looking at them and base it on size of the bird. And that will help you and I tell, tell them apart. But yeah, it's a little bit tricky for anybody, regardless of how much you've been birding. But but it can be identified. And again, when they're side by side, there's no different. There's no doubt that the lessers are smaller. That's the name, I guess, right? All righty. Um, next, we have, and this might be a tough one for this space, but we can direct people to a website if need be. But what is your suet recipe, um, if it's simple enough? <sighs> My, our, and I don't, um, uh, my wife is really good about mixing it up. Uh, what we have in it is hold bird seed, just cheap hold bird seed. We have uh, lard, we have peanut butter. Um, what else does she put in it? Those are the big three ingredients. I tell you what, I put my contact information in there. Um, Email me and I'll email you the recipe. So again, it was craig.hensley at tp. I, I, uh, um, I'm not sure how we can advertise it again, but craig.hensley at tpwd.texas spelled out dot gov, and I can get you the recipe. But those are the three big ingredients. So she just mixes it all up and um, it works out great. I'm telling you, um, our store bought suet cakes would r literally rot. Um, because the birds just didn't go to them for whatever reason. That's not to say I've had good luck with those as well. But um, this recipe, uh, we have to fill our little suet feeder twice a day. Uh, the birds go crazy for it. So those are the three big ingredients that I know go into it. That's awesome. I'm going to try that out. I've never made my own. Um, and it looks like Johanna popped her email in the chat there so folks can grab it if they need Okay, perfect. Thank um, you. Yeah. So Janet asks, um, she's watching from Houston. Does a lot of this translate to the bird in her part of the state? It does. So in Houston, though, you're going to get, instead of black crested titmice, you're going to actually get tufted titmice. So they're not going to have that solid black cap or uh, crest. It's only going to be black at the base of the crest. So that's one different. You're also going to get uh, red-bellied woodpeckers instead of golden-fronted woodpeckers. So a red-bellied woodpecker, has, they look very similar. They sound very similar. But the red-bellied woodpecker has a little bit of a reddish-pinkish wash on the belly, literally. Um, they have red on the back of the head if it's a female, and they have red from the back of the head over to the base of the bill if it's a male. So they don't have that little gold patch in the forehead. So those two. But the other birds, yeah, all of the other birds um, certainly can appear in the Houston area, plus many more just because you're closer to water. You're right in that big migration uh, pathway. Uh, but yeah, that, that for the most part, those should be, um, be a couple of differences, but overall, most of those count for the Houston area. Great. Uh, I'm going to combine a few that I've seen a couple times here. Um, so does one, does hummingbird nectar go bad and how often should they change it? And then to, yeah. to also compare that, do we put out, is it good to put out fruit for birds? Like, Yeah, so two, those are two great questions because in both cases, those will go bad pretty quickly, especially the hotter it gets. So the, the in terms of hummingbird food, we typically, and, and you'll get different answers on this, but um, we typically in the summertime, in the heat of summer, even when the feeders are in the shade, we need to change those out about every two to three days. The best way to know if it's starting to go bad when you go out there and you look in the bottle and you shake it, if you can see any kind of flock, if you will, kind of a stuff floating in there, it's not even necessarily turned to mold yet, but if you can see any kind of floating stuff in there, it's time to change the feeder. So I would say in the heat of summer, for sure, every two days. In the springtime, when it's still cool at night, maybe every three to four, maybe you can get away with five days, depending on where you are in the state. In terms of fruit, um, fruit is great. Um, a lot of people put out orange halves. Uh, they'll stake them onto a, you know, a, 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 a nail or something like that, or nail them to a tree. Those are really great for attracting, in the spring migration in particular, uh, or even fall migration. Orioles, tanagers will use them. Uh, some of the other small songbirds that are mostly insect eaters, like some of the warblers might come to them. Uh, but oranges work great. The other thing that a lot of people now use, and you can even buy feeders for this, are jelly, grape jelly feeders. Grape jelly, for whatever reason, um, birds like the orioles in particular, but also the tanagers uh, are, will, will come to the grape, uh, grape feeders, uh, and, and literally just cheap old grape jelly. Uh, works really well. Other fruits, you could probably try grapes, things like that. Um, could get pretty expensive, 
Um, and again, you have to really watch for when they start to go bad. A, an orange, half an orange in a couple of days will start turning moldy. Uh, so you'll want to change those out pretty quickly, so. Great. Um, the next one, question comes from Dawn, and this depends on where she's at, but it says, do we have ladder-backed woodpeckers in this area? We do, and you know, I should have put a picture of a ladder-back. Well, ladder-backs are all over this area, so they're, but what I find, it's interesting, I live in a town, the town of Bernie, and what's interesting to me is that, um, I hear lots and lots of golden-fronted woodpeckers. We have downy woodpeckers in small numbers. Where you are up in the Balconies, you probably have more. If you go to East Texas, you're even going to have more there. In North Texas, you're going to have more downies. The ladderbacks, I, in, in my case, this I can only talk from my experience, they tend to be out more on creek bottoms in woodland areas. So they're not, in, at least where I live, I don't tend to see them in town as much. Um, but they certainly are area in our area, and I guess of the three species, I would say they are definitely the most common uh, collectively. If you take the whole area as a, uh, you take the area as a whole, so um, and I apologize I didn't put those in there. I thought about that at the last second, but it was too late. So <laughs> um, next up is do pine siskins eat fruit? And it says we've seen several birds that look like them in their persimmon trees, along with the waxwings. Well, here's the deal. Everything eats persimmons. Um, everybody, cardinals eat persimmons, orioles eat persimmons, um, finches eat persimmons. Um, find me a bird that doesn't eat a persimmon and that's a bird that should be eating persimmons if you ask me. So it wouldn't surprise me if they're doing that um, uh, because it's a great source of sugar and nutrients. And um, air, when, when the, when the, when the, um, Persimmons are ripening. It's a contest to see who can get to them first, me or the birds or, or and raccoons and everybody and foxes and everything else that eats them. So, uh, but yes, I absolutely um, a lot of different kinds of birds will eat uh, uh, fruit. So they'll take advantage of it uh, as much as they can. Absolutely. This next question is pretty interesting. Um, it's do, do any birds you know of eat dragonflies? It says we have a water garden, get tons of them, but we don't notice the birds eating them. So the birds that are going to eat dragon, dragonflies, of course, are just an awesome uh, group of organisms all by themselves and are wonderful predators, both as aquatic larvae or pupa and as adult flying adults. Um, but the birds that I see them eat, are eating them are things like great crested flycatchers and phoebes, eastern phoebes. I showed you pictures of both of those. Um, yes, uh, Lori Malloy said Mississippi kites when they will eat dragonflies right and left all the time. Um, of course, we don't have very many <laughs> Mississippi kites ex around here except in migration. Um, but yeah, the, in the flying insect birds that are flying out from the trees and snatching things out of the air will eat them. Uh, what did I just take a picture of recently? I took a picture of a, um, I think it was a blue-headed vireo actually that was eating a damselfly. So those, those insect eating birds, especially the ones that sally out, they refer to that as sallying. They'll sit on a branch, sally out, grab a flying insect, come back and eat it. Uh, but those, the Phoebes and the great crested flycatchers are two prime examples. Ash-throated flycatchers, scissor-tailed flycatchers uh, likely do the same thing. And I should probably not leave out um, uh, loggerhead shrikes. We'll do that too. Awesome, yeah. Um, all right, next up, what is your favorite bird book? You already mentioned the Sibleys, but uh, do you have a handful that you like? Well, the Sibleys is the one that I really prefer the most. So that is number one and number two and number 2A. So that's the one I use. Um, you know, when I was younger, I used the Golden Guide to Birds of North America, and they still sell it. The first version I had was $4.95. Um, the thing that I like about that book and this book in particular, they have excellent paintings. And with the Sibley's Guide, you'll notice you have multiple paintings. Not only are there paintings of them standing, depending on the bird, but they're in flight. So you really get a good look. And this book really focuses heavily on identification tips. So again, really good. It's a big book. You can buy Eastern and Western, um, but this is the one um, my wife uses, uh, Ken Kaufman's bird book. It's photographs, and I, I love photograph field guides, especially when it comes to dragonflies and butterflies. But I love the painting field guides, uh, painted uh, uh, images, field guides for, uh, for birds, just because they can kind of stylize them in a more 
you get all the good characteristics in one painting where you, uh, in a photograph, you may not always get that. So, but, but everybody's got profess, uh, pr uh, a preference. A lot of people use the National Geographic Guide. Um, that is uh, one that I have a copy of. I don't take it into the field very often. I find the paintings on those a little bit different. Um, so again, Sibley's is my go-to book, but again, there's lots of them. There's also a great app you can put on your phone. Um, and there's several of those apps out there. Let me see if I can pull up real quickly here. Uh, the one that I, I most often use um, is iBird Pro. Uh, it's a great app. You can pull up any bird in the world and look and take a look at them. But there's also, and somebody out there probably can help me because I can never remember the name of it. Um, Audubon has a bird app that's, that's really good. Um, help Merlin, me. Merlin yeah. thank you, Lori. Merlin, yes. That's one, that's a good app, especially for beginning birders. Merlin is a really good app that you can use as well. So there's some good ones. But if I'm going to carry a book in the field, uh, I'm going to pay somebody to carry this big, heavy thing. No, not really, but, you know, it is big and heavy. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is the book I'm going to use most of the time. This is my clean indoor copy. You should see my field copy. And it's got duct tape on it. I've seen folks so. mention a couple of times um, All About Birds website is a really good one for people to get ID things. And yes. as well as eBird, you could look at stuff on there. So I encourage folks to check eBird's a good one too. Out. Hey, another, an, another great source is iNaturalist because you can go to iNaturalist and people post all those birds. You can do a search for a specific bird species, pull up all kinds of photograph images of them. Um, and uh, that, so iNaturalist works great for bird identification as well. Great. Um, back to your suet recipe here. Um, do you use just commercial peanut butter or just ground peanuts? We use commercial, we buy the cheapest uh, peanut butter we can find. So the off-brand peanut butter. And um, she, I, she, I think she normally buys the crunchy peanut butter because it's got those extra ground up peanuts in it. So yeah, so just crunchy, cheap peanut butter. Sorry, we don't feed Skippy to the birds, but the birds don't seem to mind, so. <laughs> or Jeff or whatever the other ones are. <laughs> the next one goes along with the rats, but she says that raccoons eat her suet. Do you yeah. have any uh, suggestions for the raccoons? That's a tough so one. What I, that's a very tough one. What I end up doing um, is I just take the suet feeder down uh, every night um, or make sure it's empty. Uh, that's the only way I can keep the raccoons from bothering it because that would just clean it out. Um, so, I, I, so there are times, the other, I also have a platform feeder uh, that's sitting on the, uh, on a pot, um, big plant pot. I put that in our little greenhouse every night as well, because otherwise raccoons tip it over and, and just do all kinds of things. Interestingly enough, the raccoons aren't bothering my tube feeders that are hanging on hooks, which is weird because at, where my office is here at Cibolo Nature Center in Bernie, they literally have pulled the, the entire metal post out of the ground to get to one bird feeder I have. So I have to pull that feeder in as well at night. So, but with suet, yeah, the best thing to do is pull it in at night and uh, then put it back out in the morning. That's what I would recommend. Great. Just a couple more here. I think we're going to be able to get them all before okay. our time runs out here. Um, do birds eat the berries from Yopon Holly? He said he's not seeing, you know, any birds on them. So, so they will eventually. So Yopon holly uh, and uh, possum haw berries with those bright red uh, berries, it seems like they don't ripen until real late in the winter time. So they don't seem to be eaten. I noticed that too. They don't get eaten early in the, in the season. Now, if there are mockingbirds around, the mockingbirds will guard those trees. Uh, eventually, th those fruits will get eaten. But, but for whatever reason, I, I agree that for the most part, they don't seem to get eaten in the fall or early winter, but at the end of the winter, and it might be just that, that uh, they don't taste as good. Maybe it takes longer for, the, for it to ripen to the point where they want them. And there, may, and there also may just be better choices around. Uh, hackberries, for example, are real popular. And I look at a hackberry fruit and it's like, there's hardly any meat on this thing. It's mostly seed and yet birds gobble them down like crazy. So, um, but yes, they will eat them eventually. Um, uh, but it seems to be later in the winter. Great. Um, the next one goes back to the Sibley's bird. Is in the Austin area, should we buy the Eastern or the Western uh, book? That's what I was good. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for somebody for bringing that up. Here's the problem with Texas, the Central Texas. We are in the middle of every field guide 
national field guide you can come up with. Butterflies, dragonflies, birds, we're right in the middle. So, so if you buy the Western, it's going to cover most of the birds you're going to see, but maybe not all. If you buy the Eastern, it's going to cover, cover some of the birds you're going to see, but maybe not all. So the best thing I think to do is just, you know, is to buy the big one uh, that covers all of North America uh, so that you don't kind of get fooled or, or, or tricked by that. Unfortunately, um, yeah, we happen to be just dead center of those Eastern Western things. So uh, you know, there's a West, uh, there's a moths of Eastern North America. There's no moths of Western North America uh, yet. So those kind of books are out there. But yeah, I would, um, uh, or y'all, especially in the Balcones area, I would probably buy the the uh, the big one. If you're in Houston and you're only going to bird watch in Houston, buy the Eastern Guide. If you're in Amarillo um, or out west by the Western Guide, and that way you're, you're it's a typical standard field guide size as opposed to this this big old book that you have here. Great. Um, looks like we just have a couple more uh, minutes here, so I'm going to get to maybe one more, two more questions. Um, okay. How can you keep wasps out of your birdhouse? Boy, I've heard different things. Uh, the thing that uh, they have bluebird trails that they monitor here at Cibolo Nature Center, they'll actually take petroleum jelly and they'll wipe petroleum uh, jelly on the upper part of the inside of the um, walls of the birdhouse and then also on the r inside roof of the, of the birdhouse. And supposedly that helps keep the wasps from being able to build there. I don't know that that's 100%, um, uh, but that can help supposedly they they have some luck with that that's the that's really the only thing i've really heard you know um that works very well great and with that it's right at time johanna did you have anything in closing or uh no just a great big thank you craig this was wonderful really happy to do it sorry for the technological glitches at the beginning but uh Oh, uh, no, we we're way through them. So, yeah, no, these days it happens all the time whether we prepare for it or not. So, um, yeah, and exactly. So, uh, everybody has your e email address now for follow up questions and uh, happy birthday, Great. everybody. Absolutely. Get out there and enjoy nature. Y'all take good care and have a merry, merry holiday season. Bye. Thanks, Craig. Great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.